but I, I wanted to get a quick show of hands. How many of you would consider yourself to have a good memory? Raise your hand if, you can, if somebody says you've got a good or a bad memory. Raise your hand if you've got a good memory. Uh, we got a little half memory. We got <laughs> Okay. Well, congratulations. Okay, raise your hand if you have a bad memory. Okay, you're my people. You're my people. Okay, so um, I, I, it's one of God's great gifts to me that I have a bad memory. So you could wrong me, and I'll probably forget it within a week. So just wait a week, then pretend it never happened. I'll be like, oh, yeah, we're good. Um, but I have a terrible memory. Um, and so today we're going to look, about how, look at the Spirit coming to um, guide the disciples into all truth, Jesus will say. And it got me thinking about memory. Now, some of Jesus' 12 disciples, because he's talking to the 12, probably at this point the 11, Judas had gone off to do his deed, um, and he's talking to them. And some of them probably had good memories, probably some of them had not so good memories. Uh, generally speaking, their ability to remember things would have probably been higher on average than us uh, because they're coming out of an oral culture, right? Not everything was written down. Things were passed along orally. And so in that sense, their culture is very different than ours. Uh, not everything was printed, and believe it or not, Google was just a few years away uh, when... Jesus gave this speech. So um, you had to remember everything in your head. But I'm sure some of the disciples hearing Jesus, knowing like, oh, this is some serious talk. He's talking about he's going away. He's predicted several times his own death. They're probably, oh, I, I don't want to forget this. Um, you know, nowadays, uh, we don't expect to remember anything. I mean, like back then, they had to memorize the capital of Montana. They did not know the capital. Does anyone know? Because somebody Google that real quick. Kalispell is is that true, Jared? No, no, no. Helena. What is the cap? Somebody Google that for me real quick. Helena. Okay. Okay. We got JC in the house. Okay. So. You see how hard that was for us. Um, if you wanted to remember who won the Oscar for Best Picture two years ago, you, you do, how would you do it? You had to remember it. Does anybody? Somebody, Google, who is that? Kona. Great movie. What? Co oh, yeah. Coda. That's right. That's a great movie about a fishing boat, a family. Oh, great. I did not remember that, and I, lo and I love, I, ben, Ben's my movie guy, so, um, okay, most of us didn't remember. That was two years ago, okay, that's, why, we don't remember anything. Um, I was telling a story to my alpha table a couple weeks ago about a trip to Europe I took in my 20s with my best friend, best man at my wedding, known him since I was two. Um, he was working in investment banking, so he was making more money than he should have. And uh, so there's this exchange program, uh, or not exchange program, with BMW. So if you fly to Europe, go to Munich, go to the factory, you get a discount. You take the car and you drive it to another location, and then they ship it to the U.S. You save some money, but their thought is if we can entice you to come over, see the factory, you'll be a lifelong BMW uh, addict. You know, joke's on them, he drives a Tesla now. So, uh, so we were in, we traveled all over Europe, but one of our stops was Munich to the factory there, and we picked up his brand new car, and we drove it, we had to drive it to Zurich, Switzerland, for the drop-off. Uh, Tom, Tom, is Tom in here? Is he with the kids? Have you made that drive, Munich to Zurich? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you've, you know. Um, have you ever done that drive, you know, as an American uh, without GPS? 
You have not, because you're not an American. Yeah, you're from the Netherlands. So I knew I had you on that. But uh, so um, no GPS map. We had printed out directions, but we got a little bit lost. And we're driving through these small villages, lots of roundabouts over there uh, in Switzerland, trying to make our way to Zurich to drop off the car. And we had to get it there at a certain time. Uh, in order to make the handoff of the keys. And I was texting with my buddy this week, and I said, do you remember, because he's the one in our friendship that has the great memory, and he sent me, I can show you a long list of things he remembered. All I remembered is we were lost. And it was difficult. Um, I think we stopped, asked for directions. There was like, apparently a large lake, he said, and we thought, well, if we just drive around the lake, I'm sure we'll find our way to Switzerland. I don't know what we were thinking about mountains and streams. Anyhow, it was actually quite a miracle. We showed up as the office manager was locking the door. We pulled up, three American guys in their 20s, pulled up and said, wait, <laughs> we've got the keys. And we ran up there and we gave it to her and all was well. But as we were going through, we had to do it by our own sheer wit. And it was difficult. That's the way things used to be. You used to have to ask for directions. You used to have handheld maps. You used to stop at gas stations. You used to lick your finger and stick it in the air. <laughs> for some reason, maybe the wind will take you. You might have even had to use a payphone back in the day. But nowadays, you don't have to remember anything. So imagine the panic on the disciples' faces when the, Jesus tells them in his farewell speech that he will be leaving. And it will be up to them to take his message to the world. Imagine the fear that you would experience Jesus is basically telling them they will be the guardians of the truth. They will express to the world the way in which to connect with God and experience salvation and enter the kingdom of God. They were probably thinking, as we've said again and again over the last few weeks, no way. And Jesus is going to tell them again today, Yahweh. I will not leave you alone. The Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of truth, after I leave, will come and direct you in all truth. Now, he's not going to be talking about every possible thing there is to know, but all that matters for life and faith, salvation, and staying close to God. He's not going to tell them about microbes. He's not going to tell them about black holes, things like that. Things that we might wish the Spirit would lead us into, but apparently they're less important. So, we've heard about this Spirit of God already, and he's going to tell us a few more things that the Spirit of God will do. Now, let me just give you a quick review. Look at John 15, 26. So turn back a couple pages. John 15, 26 says this. When the counselor, that's the word paraclete, if you go back and listen to the other sermons, when the paraclete comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. So we talked about that last week. Then in verse 27 he says, you also, talking to the disciples, will testify about who? About me. Because you have been with me from the beginning. So this is key here, and I'll just say this a couple times throughout the sermon. It's always hard to know when you're studying John's recounting of this farewell speech, which are the things that are for the immediate disciples who will become known as the apostles. Apostles mean sent ones. So Jesus sends the the 12 out into the world with the Great Commission. So the, they become, so I'll use apostles and disciples interchangeably. But 
Anyone who follows Jesus, sits under Jesus' teaching, follows him as Lord, as master of their life, is a disciple of Jesus. But there's something very unique about these particular first 11. Uh, Judas, as we'll read about on Good Friday, betrays Jesus, leaves, turns him in, um, so there's 11 left. But they become this very important group, and Jesus says, because you have been with me from the beginning. So just hold that little nugget in your head, because as we're going through, we're going to ask the question, which of these promises are specific to the apostles or or the first 11 disciples, and which are common to all followers of Jesus, okay? So we'll be asking that question. But the thing I want to point out is, the Spirit will come and testify about Jesus, and we also, starting with the 12, and then all of us, will testify about Jesus as well. What a great, we've said this, what a great privilege to get to testify and be a witness, being called to the stand for Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? We can only do that, Jesus is about to tell us, if we have the Spirit helping us. So then over the last several weeks, we've covered these important um, descriptions of the paraclete. We've said uh, often that word is translated as the helper or the advocate or the counselor or the comforter. It's a really difficult word to translate because it's not used many places in ancient Near East literature. And it's also not used very often in the Bible. Only really John uses it and uses it just a few times. But he's used it, remember, we said, not only of the Holy Spirit, but also of Jesus. Jesus is called the paraclete as well. And so one of the things we said a couple weeks ago is we can understand paraclete, this Greek word, as the title used not only of the Holy Spirit, but also of Jesus, but not only of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, but also of the Father. The Father is the one that sends the Holy Spirit. The Father is the one that sends the Son. And so the Father is also a helper, advocate, comforter, and counselor. And so this title of the paraclete is actually a title that can be a descriptor of the ministerial office of the Trinitarian God. One God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, and and. All of God is a paraclete for the church. Para just means to come alongside as he comforts, counsels, reminds, and then as we saw last week, convicts. The Spirit will convict the world of sin, convict the world of righteousness, convict the world of judgment. And convict here means to make obvious. To make obvious what is not previously obvious. And that's actually an act of love. So you can go back and listen to that sermon. It's an act of love because it shows us the way to true life. Maybe it's not obvious that we're falling short. Maybe it's not obvious that we're not experiencing life to the full. Maybe it's not obvious of the effects of sin. And the Spirit makes that obvious to us. We talked about that last week. And then the Spirit makes obvious for us what true righteousness looks like. That's what Jesus did in the flesh. He made obvious what true righteousness is. You read the Sermon on the Mount. He reorients this very religious community's understanding of even what the law was because they had missed true righteousness and they were practicing either fake righteousness or self-righteousness. And he makes obvious. He convicts the world of righteousness. And then we said, he convicts the world through the Holy Spirit of the obviousness of judgment of the victory of Jesus on the cross and by the resurrection. Sign, sealed, delivered. Judgment or victory has been won. So, then we paused last week uh, because verse 12 says this, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. And like many of my sermons, We couldn't bear anymore, so we stopped there, and then Jesus is going to give us two additional things that the Spirit does. And those two things are this. One, the way in which the Spirit will inspire, I think this is what he's alluding to, he will inspire the New Testament writings of the apostles, that we have 
here with us in the books of the New Testament. Then, the second thing is the way that the Spirit will glorify the Son. Jesus will say, the Spirit will glorify me. So, that's where we're going to focus, but I wanted to bring you in. This is what's always hard about teaching a speech Jesus, Jesus did all together over multiple weeks. So, let's read now John 16, 12 to 15. It says this. John 16, verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take from what is Mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Okay. These are amazing. But, as we've seen with the rest of the speech, mysterious words to some degree. So what is Jesus' promise? I read to my son Grayson the very first line here. Um... I said, what do you think this means? I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. And Grayson looks at me, he said, wait and see. I said, oh, that's great. So I wrote it in, wait and see. Like my kids have come to know that if you take them to the movie theater and you wait until after the initial credits, there's often more to be shared. This is sort of a new phenomenon. Thank you, Marvel. But there is, there's something there. So they sit there. Even if there's not, they'll wait to the bitter end. And I'm like, guys, we got to go. I don't think this is one of those kind of movies. <laughs> but they're like, no, Dad, let's wait and see. And they just wait. This is what Jesus is telling his disciples. Wait and see. I have still more to reveal to you. Just when you think I'm done teaching you, I've got more coming your way. But you got to wait and see. You got to wait, big years, you got to listen. You got to be near to me. You got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I will reveal new things to you that I haven't even taught you while I was here with you. You can't bear them now. It's actually too much for you. Jesus knows it's too much for you. And so he reveals them over time to the disciples, to the apostles, so that they might then teach the world. I just love that. Wait and see. Um, And this is very important to say up front. This is very important because some people will say, well, I'm just one of those Jesus teaching only kind of Christians. He'll say, you know what? I love the Jesus bit. I love the Sermon on the Mount. I love the Beatitudes. I love the parables. So I'm just going to take the Jesus bit, and we'll just leave the other writings of those first Christians. We'll just leave those out. Those are too confusing. Those bring up too many hard issues. I'm one of those Jesus-only kind of Christians. You might call these red-letter Christians. It's like, this is what I do. I look for the red letters in my Bible, and this is what I live on. Now, it's a good start, but I want you to see that that limitation that you're putting on God himself is not a limitation that Jesus wants anything to do with. It's Jesus himself who says, I've got more to say. I've got more to teach. Even after I leave, I will send you the spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all truth. So it's important to remember that if you're like a, I'm a Jesus teaching only kind of Christian, you'd have to take this teaching out. And then you get into sort of a sticky situation. Because it's like, why do you take this one out? The one where he says he's going to teach even after he's gone. Well, 
Let's, be, let's just like be super cynical for a second. We could say something like this, like, well, maybe John, you know, concerned with his own publishing career, thought, I'll just sneak this bit in here so that people will buy my books <laughs> when I write more of what Jesus said. Right? Like, maybe it's just the disciples or apostles throw little nuggets in here or there to try to get people to listen to them. And I thought about this week. I'm always trying to outthink the world for Christ. That's, that's a, a great motto I got from my seminary prof, Dr. Douglas Groteis. Outthink the world for Christ. So I'm going to be as cynical or more cynical than the world and see, does that make any sense of the data that we have? So I thought about this week. Maybe John just snuck this in. He kind of like wrote his own back book cover with Jesus' quote, and I will guide you into all truth, Jesus. And this is some of that truth. I highly recommend this book. These things are supposed to be funny, by the way. So um, <laughs> let, me, let me let you think about that for a sec, about the nature of jokes, the nature of getting it. I will be bringing that up later, so I want you to understand. Mm. That is funny to think about Jesus writing a recommendation on a back book cover. That is funny. Oh, I get it now. Okay. Okay. So, if we're being as cynical as we can possibly be, that maybe the disciples sort of put in some publicity into their own writings, and if I put it in Jesus' mouth, then people will really think that the things I'm writing are important. Okay, so if that were the case, would John or any of the other apostles have written it this way? Like, this is super mysterious. If I wanted to insert some sort of a non-Jesus quote about him actually revealing more truth after he was gone, I would have written it like this. Ready? When the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears from me. He will also declare to you what is to come, to you twelve disciples, and, he will, and you will write them down in your own words, and those words will spread to the end of the earth. John, you will write like five or six of them, and Peter, you will write a few too. And there'll be this fellow named Paul, he'll come around soon. And he'll write a bunch, but he's quite long-winded and, compo and, and composes long compound sentences. But don't worry, I'll help you understand. That's also supposed to be funny. Now, okay, so they would have made it more obvious, right? But instead, I think John just faithfully says what Jesus said. He writes down the actual words of Jesus, and the actual words of Jesus tell us that the Spirit will come and reveal new truth or new understanding of the truth that you don't currently have right now. And that new truth that the Spirit will reveal will help you complete the mission that I've given you, which is the great commission to take the gospel and make disciples in all nations. Jesus said that. Okay, so how exactly will the Holy Spirit inspire the New Testament writings by the Apostle? Have you ever wondered that? Like how, how does this work? Jesus gives us a couple of indicators. And I, and I want to start with Jesus' words, and then in a second we'll look at some other words that the Apostles said as well. But again... Just for the cynics in the room, let's start with the Jesus bit and see how the disciples conceived of their own writing, okay? So Jesus said this, verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into, circle into, all truth. Now to me, the first part seems to be focused on guiding the mind and the heart of the disciples into the truth that is incarnate in the person of Jesus, right? Jesus has already called himself the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So 
when, John sa- when Jesus says the Spirit will come and will guide you into all the truth, he's not saying into something that's outside of me, but into the fullness of who I am, because I am the truth. And so everything that Jesus was and is and spoke is truth, and the Spirit will actually guide the disciples, the apostles, into a fuller understanding of that truth. So this first bit is the truth that has already been laid out for the disciples and will be further understood as the master mystery guide that is the Holy Spirit guides them through the challenging bits, right? Like even, I bet some of them didn't get Jesus' jokes. Some of them didn't understand the parables. They definitely didn't understand the need for him to die and rise again. They didn't understand a lot of this, and so the Spirit will come and, and guide them through into that truth that already exists Oh, that's what he meant by the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Oh. Spirit does that. Okay. So, not only does the Spirit illuminate that what they already remember, but let's go back now to John 14, verses 25 and 26. Because this is another place where Jesus has spoken about the paraclete, the Holy Spirit in this case. Verse 25 says of chapter 14, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. He's talking about things he said while he was with them. Verse 26, but the counselor, that's the paraclete is the Greek word, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. So not only... Does the Spirit illuminate new parts of Jesus' teaching, but also reminds them, for those with bad memories, of what actually Jesus said? And so there's two things that are amazing about that. First is that we can trust that the things that were written down by the gospel writers were, in fact, the words of Jesus, because the Spirit is guiding them. They're not just given their best attempt. They're being guided by the Spirit to remember everything that Jesus said while he was with them. And in their remembering comes along, like we've said, these new transcendent realizations and understandings about that weren't there when Jesus first spoke them. So as the Spirit's bringing this stuff back to mind, as, as the apostles and those connected to the apostles are writing down the words of Scripture, they are not doing it on their own, but the Spirit is giving them the words and the, and the realization to then write what they write. So, there might be these dormant realities. Sort of, you could think about them like Jesus' parable of the seeds. These dormant seeds of the raw data of things Jesus said. And then when the Spirit comes, these seeds burst to life. And the life is everything after the Gospels. That's what Jesus promises will happen. I've I've buried some seeds deep in you, and they will come to life when the Spirit comes, and it will blossom into new revelation for the world. And you guys get to participate in that, Jesus is saying to the 11. Okay. That's pretty cool. Now, for me, this phenomenon of a seed being planted and then at a later date coming to life is really good news. It's really reassuring for me, personally. Why do I say that? Well, for some of us in the room, and all of us at one time were this person, some of us maybe have heard the gospel so many times. We've heard good, orthodox, true teaching about who Jesus is, what he's commanded, what he will do, but it's just never clicked. I mean, the seeds have been cast, and they're just lying dormant. I don't think this is a one-time phenomenon that happened for the disciples. Now, writing the New Testament is a one-time phenomenon. But this phenomenon, that the same Spirit, the same Helper, that illuminates these new transcendent realities for the disciples, still happens in every season, in every era, for the church. 
So that might be you. You might have heard this and you're sitting here and you're like, it's just never come to life in me. You can ask God to send you the helper, the one who comes into the world, the master guide that will guide you into the mysteries. And over your life, you will see these seeds that have been cast coming to life in new ways. That's really good news. That's really good news. Now, that's happened at, for every single one of you who believes that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and friend. It's happened to you. Now, after it happens to you, then you become a person who hopefully shares some of this good teaching about who Jesus is and what Jesus taught and what Jesus did and how the gospel really is. And you've shared these things Maybe with children, maybe with a friend, maybe with a sibling, maybe with lots of friends. Um, and you've shared it, the truth of Jesus, but it's just not doing anything. It doesn't seem to be clicking. Um, and you're wondering, was all that spreading of truth worth it? Was all that teaching worth it? Well, Jesus actually had the same thought. Sometimes he'd look at the disciples and be like, I can't believe you're not getting that. But the promise here is, as long as good seed has been cast, true teaching has been made, we don't get to decide on the timing, but if we wait and see, the Spirit can come and bring that to life. That is incredibly reassuring to me as a preacher, as a teacher. I say things all the time <laughs> that I think are profound and life-changing, and yet no lives are changed. And so, again, laughter, please, thank you. Um, that's okay. I fully expect that at some time, Many years down the road, many people who have come and sat and, and learned will at one moment just all of a sudden have an aha moment. I'll probably never hear about it, this side of heaven, but they'll say, oh, that's what that meant. That's what Dave was trying to say. That's what Ryan was trying to say. That's what my cohort leader was trying to explain. That's what my alpha table, like this is happening all the time. It happened for me. My parents taught me good things along the way, and it never, eh, okay. And then it, all of a sudden, boom, the Spirit comes and brings to life all that good seed. That's what the Spirit does. Is that reassuring for anybody but me? Does anybody have someone that they've shared the good news with, shared the teachings of Jesus, shared the profoundness of the, the cross and the resurrection, and just has never quite clicked? Well, that's not your job to make it click. Your job is to share it. Your job is to send them Bible Project videos, <laughs> send them a good book. I can't tell you how many times I've given a great book to somebody, and it's never been read. Well, one day they might see it there on the shelf, and something stirs in them to pick that up and begin to read. This happens all the time. Don't stop giving away the good teaching of Jesus and the apostles because God, when time is right, will send his spirit and bring that to life. But that's not up to you. Man, that's so reassuring to me. That's so reassuring. Whether it's clicked for me yet or not, that actually God is the one who brings it to life through the spirit. And he will guide me into all truth. Okay, the second thing that the Spirit does, or the second way in which the Spirit brings truth into the world, goes like this. So it's also in verse 13. It says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father and me. So whatever he hears from the Father and me, he will now speak to you. So the Holy Spirit doesn't teach, as we've said, some new novel message. There's not like the message of the Holy Spirit and the message of Jesus. There's not 
The message of the Father in the Old Testament, the message of Jesus in the Gospels, and the message of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. It's all one story, one message, one producer, one editor, God himself who reveals it in these different eras for one perfect truth that leads to life and life to the full. The Spirit doesn't do anything on his own. I love that. There's continuity in the message of God and in the mission of God. There's no competition. And so when Jesus says this to the disciples who are, will become the apostles, the sent ones, um, Jesus is, is really telling them that God is going to continue to deliver his word through you. The apostles, as we've said, are unique in this. Like the words I say are not in any way equivalent to these words. That's why we start with these words and then we try to understand them. And the Spirit helps us in the understanding and the interpreting. But for the disciples and the apostles, God was giving them new revelation into the mysteries of God to reveal to the world. And so... Um, because of that, we have the very teachings of Jesus. Now, Paul will say, the Apostle Paul, who was one untimely board, born, as he says, because he wasn't in the room when these things were spoken, but he was confirmed as an apostle. He appeared to Jesus on the road to Damascus. He appeared to the risen Jesus, appeared to the Apostle Paul. He was confirmed as an apostle. The Apostle Paul, writing about what Scripture is, says that the words of Scripture are breathed out by God. They are divinely then protected by God so that when we read these words today, we know we are interacting with Jesus himself by way of the Holy Spirit. So I think Jesus has this reality in mind when he says these things. Or another way to say that is, I don't think Jesus is sitting up in heaven looking at us reading John's gospel and thinking to himself, oh man, what have these guys added to my teaching? He's thinking, good, they got the message, they delivered the message, that's great. So this is the New Testament, this collection of additional teachings that even the disciples themselves were not ready to bear, could not take in until the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, and the sending of the Spirit. There's a new revelation that was coming. So when we think about this collection of writings that we have, maybe you've had questions about that. Well, how do we know? These are good questions. How do we know we've got the right ones? How do we know we've got all of the additional teachings of Jesus? How do we know Jesus isn't still revealing new things to new prophets down the way? Like, how can we know that? These are great questions to ask, and people have asked them. Um, so, how do we know we've got them all? Why do, why, do we know, why do we know it should just be the apostle-connected writings and not things that came a little bit after that or things that were coming from non-apostle-connected writers? So some people, you know, some, a lot of people have heard of the Gospel of Thomas. I was telling Pastor Ryan about this. The Gospel of Thomas. He's like, oh, when people bring up the Gospel of Thomas, I always just ask them, well, do you know about the other 50 Gospel of Thomas-like writings? And most people say, oh, I didn't know there was like another 50 of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. It was kind of common to write something many years after the apostles died in the name of an apostle because then people would kind of think that's cool. Whether it's trying to trick people, or just saying, like, this is what the Apostle Thomas might have written. That was like a common thing. So we have lots of examples of that. So why don't we take in the Gospel of Thomas and the 50 or so others that are like that as the same as the New Testament writings? Well, the main reason is that the Gospel of Thomas was not written by Thomas. The writing style... The vocabulary used, it's very clear that that is coming from a time much later than the writings that we have contained herein. 
And so, that's the first test. Was it written by a sent one of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus who this promise is given to? And, and if not, why should we think that this is the promised additional teachings of Jesus? Okay? So, a good question then you ask is, well, what about the Apostle Paul? He wasn't in the room when Jesus said these things. The writings of Paul are probably the most challenged writings, and he wrote half of the New Testament. So, how can we trust the Apostle Paul? Well, for one, we know that the Apostle Paul was living at the same time as the Apostles. We knew that he knew the Apostles. We knew that him and the Apostles were in cahoots. They were working together. They often talked. And then we can look at certain things that other Apostles, who we know were in the room here, who we know we're hearing firsthand from Jesus, said about the Apostle Paul. So I'm going to read a few passages from Peter. And this is not only to help us understand why we can trust Paul's writings, but also what Peter, as the kind of leader of the group of apostles and, and disciples, what he thought about the writing of the disciples and the apostles. So let's read a couple of these together, then I'll explain them. So this is, these are all coming from 2 Peter, which is Peter's second letter that we have saved for us. Okay, so 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21 says this. Above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man, instead Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, is Paul talking about, or is Peter talking about the Old Testament prophets? Or is he including himself in there? We don't quite know yet. We just know that this sounds very similar to what Jesus promised would happen, that prophets are carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so then let's read 2 Peter 3, 1 to 3. Peter writes this, Dear friends, this is now the second letter that I've written to you. In both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder, so that you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of the Lord and Savior, Savior given through your apostles. So he He's putting the holy prophets of the Old Testament so that they might recall the words spoken of the holy prophets. He's putting that right alongside the commands of the Lord and Savior given through your apostles. So in Peter's mind, those two categories are equivalent. And it's clear that the commands of the Lord and Savior Jesus are given to the people through the apostles. Okay. Now let's look at 2 Peter 3, 14 to 16. Peter writes this, Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight. That's in God's sight, in Christ's sight, at peace. Also, regard the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these things in all his letters. So they are aware of all of Paul's letters. And if you don't understand, Paul, Paul is known for long, complex, compound sentences. Just try to study in the Greek like Ryan and I had to do in seminary. It's just amazing how he weaves these things together. And he's got a lot of letters. Peter says, and I've read them all. And this is the wisdom that was given to Paul. And then he goes on to say, there are some things that are hard to understand in them. The untaught and unstable will twist them to their own destructions, as they also do, this is key, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures. And again, when, when the New Testament writers talk about scriptures, they're talking about the Old Testament scriptures written by the prophets before Jesus came. So right here, Peter, the rock, Jesus calls him, I'll build my church on this rock. 
It's kind of like the band leader of all the apostles. He is saying, I've read all these letters of Paul. They can be hard to understand. And just like the rest of Scripture that's hard to understand, without the help of the Holy Spirit, you won't understand them. But here Peter is putting on par with the Scriptures of old the new Scriptures of the Apostle Paul. And I think of all the apostolic writings that we have for us in the New Testament. So this is interesting, isn't it? Peter and the apostles, including Paul, are put on the same pedestal as the Old Testament prophets. The apostle of the apostles, Peter, has no question in his mind that God is speaking wisdom through Paul. And I think he believes God is speaking wisdom through his own writings. And that new truth is coming into the world. New mysteries are being revealed now to the church in the same way that the prophets of the Old Testament were revealing new truths, unveiling mysteries in the Old Testament for the people of God. Do you see this? This is, a, this is an amazing, and maybe you've never thought of the apostles like this or the New Testament writings like this. Or maybe you've struggled to understand. But I think it's very clear here that, that Jesus is telling them that they will now be the new mouthpieces of God. I mean, imagine hearing that from Jesus. You will be like the prophets of old. I will use you as my mouthpiece to speak to the world, to speak to my people to correct my people, to guide my people. Yeah, and there's some things that I, I have to wait and tell you because as the church goes, we'll need corrective measures. This is how the prophets worked. They were speaking, not in a vacuum, but in the reality of the way Israel was going. Often going away from God, and God would send a prophet to steer them back. And you will be my new prophets, is what he's saying in the world. I'm not sure you've thought about that. That's who the apostles are. And then it makes sense when you think about it that way and you understand what happened to the Old Testament prophets because if you study the Old Testament prophets, there wasn't a lot of them. Like there were a lot of them, but not a lot of them. What do I mean by that? There were a lot of them. Like there was a profession, like you could go to school and get a degree in being a prophet. And you'd try to go get a job with the king or with some other outpost and and your job was to be a prophet. But then there was always like one or two guys at any given time that were like saying something very different than what all the professional prophets were saying. The professional prophets tended to tickle the ears of the king, tell the king what he wanted to hear. Oh, you're so great, king. Oh, if you do this. But they weren't actually hearing from God. And then there was some other, some other cats. You might, have, you might have heard of them, like Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah. And Ezekiel. And Dan, I mean, these cats were going out on a limb. They were saying some things. And that got them in big trouble. Most of the prophets were kicked, hated by the people. Hated by the other prophets. Kicked out of the community. What did Ryan talk about just two weeks ago? If you go back in the speech, just before Jesus is going to tell these disciples... If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before you. You're going to be kicked out of the synagogue, he tells them. Don't be surprised. Why? That's what always happened to the prophets. Man, that clicked for me this week. That's what Jesus is telling these apostles. I'm going to send you into the world. The world will not receive you. It did not receive me, but it didn't receive the prophets of old. You will be like the prophets of old, my mouthpiece, and it will affect you. You will be thrown out, just like they were thrown out. But what will also be true? Who are we reading? We're not reading these professional prophets. We're reading Ezekiel. We're reading Daniel. We're reading Isaiah. Why? Because when the people of God, in every generation, read the words, it cut them to the heart, and they knew these aren't the mere words of man, that God has spoken through these people, that God has spoken to us. And in the same way, 
When you read a letter from Peter, a letter from John, a letter from Paul, one of the things that's the same as the Old Testament is that, that it cut people to the heart. People that were sincere and honest, it cut them to the heart, and they were convicted of sin, they were convicted of righteousness, they were convicted of judgment, they were comforted, they were guided, they were counseled. They felt the love of God pouring out through these writings, just like the Old Testament prophets. And that's why the Old Testament prophets were included in the canon of Scripture. And that's why the New Testament prophets are included in the canon of Scripture. Something different happened when early Christians read these letters. It was like the Spirit of God was flowing on every word. Why? Because it's the Spirit of God who breathed out every word. See the symmetry? So they got passed along. Churches made copies of the letters, sent them to other churches. Other churches were edified in the same way, and they made copies and sent them on, on and on and on. And you know where this phenomenon didn't happen? The Gospel of Thomas. The 50 other so-called Gospels or letters or things written. Because they did not have the Spirit of God flowing on them. So the spirit of truth speaks the truth and then confirms the truth, and that's how we end up with the truth. All the truth that we need. We're brought in and guided into all that Jesus wanted to teach both when he was with us and after he left through the apostles. That's what the New Testament is. Jesus kept his promise. Jesus continues to guide us today as we read these words And we too are cut to the heart. We too are comforted. We too are brought into a fuller understanding of the reality of God's kingdom, his salvation, and the fullness of his plan for us. This Holy Spirit comes. Now, much more could be said, like some of you, like, tell me more how we can trust the scriptures. Many more things could be said. I've got books I could recommend to you. Um... But we're talking here about biblical inspiration and biblical inerrancy, and um, these are big subjects. Uh, But one litmus test I want to close with is this. The final litmus test goes like this. And look at it with me in verse 14. Verse 14 says, He, that is the Holy Spirit, will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit always glorifies the Son. And so any writing, any teaching, both in this time and even now, that does not lift up Jesus and make him unique in the way that he is taught about, making his name, putting his name above every name, not putting his name on the same plane as any other name, But any teaching that does that, that is one of the litmus tests for understanding whether or not the Spirit has been a part of inspiring that message. So, any preacher, teacher, guru, politician, celebrity, whatever, that says something that is not first and foremost glorifying the Son, Jesus Christ, we can be sure the Spirit of God is not a part of that. They might be saying true things, maybe, but they are not saying the truest thing. It is not the truest truth unless Jesus Christ is glorified because that's what the Spirit does. That's what Jesus says the Spirit will do. He will glorify me. Now, what an arrogant thing to say for the king of humility. But it's true. The best thing for the world is the name and the person of Jesus elevated above all names, above all things. He is the only worthy and capable object of our worship, of our praise. And in him, our hearts, our souls find their rest. So it's good. He's not being arrogant. He's just saying, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will make sure things are presented in the right order. Christ alone glorified above all else. Otherwise, it's some other kind of teaching, not from the Spirit. Now, I love that. Um, 
on sort of a meta level, a macro level, um, but I want to say this reality that the Spirit glorifies Jesus, the Son, happens on an individual level as well. So you can, you can use that litmus test to test teaching, to test preachers, to test, you know, gurus or religions or whatever, and you can just have that knowledge that that happens for you individually, regardless of if you ever teach or do anything. The Spirit works to glorify the Son beyond just Scripture, beyond just teaching. He does it for me. Okay, so... When, when Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will glorify me. What, what, is, what does this mean? Okay, glory means to make real that which doesn't quite feel real. So, if you glorify something, you make it more real. Uh, another way you could say it, it, it becomes weightier. You just feel the weight of it. Glory is like weight. When it's used, it's like becomes weighty. Um, some, sometimes, like in al- on the al- on Alpha, we teach people, like, sometimes you just pray with your palms up to heaven. And I've had this experience where I, as I'm praying, I just feel like my hands get heavy as the presence of God is with me. So the glory of God and the presence of God is weighty. His burden is light, but his presence is weighty. So another way glory is used is to show brilliance. Okay? So... Um, One of the things that might happen for you, because Jesus is not just an idea, he's not just a philosophy, he's not just an ideation, he's real, he's a real person. And so, when the Spirit comes upon you, Jesus says, the Spirit will make me real to you. I will no longer just be an idea to you or a set of teachings maybe that you've even affirmed. Like some of you in the room might have affirmed certain truths about Jesus. I believe this about Jesus. I believe this about Jesus. But it's still in the realm of intellectual. And when the Spirit falls on you, when you receive the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth will guide you into the fullness of the reality of Jesus. He's not just an idea. Maybe you've had that experience, maybe you've not, maybe you have not. Jesus now becomes brilliant to you. Like you, you might even just start giggling. <laughs> like, like you might have heard the same thing a hundred times, and then the hundred and first time you're like, you start giggling. Because you're like, it's it's actually true. And remember what I said when you guys don't understand comedy. Um, so sometimes you have this when somebody tells a joke, right? So the data's there. The joke has been presented to you. And you're like, you're not laughing. Why? You don't get it. But then you get it. Have you had that experience? Everyone's had that experience. It's like, it might take you a sec. And then you're like, oh, (laughs) that's hilarious, Dave. (laughs) So glad that you're here. Um, you know that experience, that aha, oh, or like maybe you watch a really complicated movie, and you're like, I don't know why every, I don't know why everyone's so excited about this movie. I, I don't really get it. And then they say, oh, watch this interview with the director writer, and then you watch like most Christopher Nolan movies are like this, and then you watch the movie, or then you watch the interview, and you're like, oh, that's what's going on there, and then it kind of comes to life to you. It becomes more real. And they're like, oh, that's why everyone's singing the praises of that movie. Right? Have you had that? Okay, so the same thing is true of Jesus. Like, Jesus is is a name that everybody's heard. Pretty much everyone's heard the name of Jesus in the world. That's fact alone is wild that, you know, I just move right on. That's fact. But most people have not had this, or not a lot have, but many have not, of the reality of the name of Jesus, the reality of the cross. They've seen the symbol over and over again, but they've never had the reality of it burst forth in them.
The Spirit of God does that. That's what Jesus is saying. The Spirit of God glorifies me. He makes me, he makes me not just an idea or a story in a history book or a story in a religious textbook. It's not just that abstract guy that you come a couple times a year at Christmas and Easter like, no. He makes real the glory of Jesus in people's hearts. That's amazing. That's what I want for you. And in my life, he's made that reality new and fresh again and again. It's not a one-time deal. It's like, if I'd preached this sermon five years ago, I would have said it one way, and now I can say it in a new way. He just keeps revealing the mystery of the glory of Jesus Christ to me again and again. That's what the Spirit does. If you've never had that experience, just keep sitting under teaching that teaches from the Word of God that was inspired by the Spirit of truth. Keep sitting underneath it. Try the best that you can to open yourself up in a posture of receiving. Try to put, a, put off the cynic's hat, the skeptic's hat. Try to stand in a posture of surrender that maybe I don't know what's really, truly true about the universe. What's really, truly true about religion. What's really, truly true about this Jesus Christ who came and died and apparently rose again. Maybe I don't know Spirit of truth, come, glorify the Son in my heart as you did in the apostles. Let's pray.